All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you for joining us. Next up, we have Revive Therapeutics, trades on the OTC pink sheets under the symbol RVVTF and on the CSE under the symbol RVV, and is a life sciences company focused on research and development of therapeutics for infectious diseases and rare disorders. And it is prior prioritizing the drug development efforts to take advantage of several regulatory incentives awarded by the FDA. Joining us today, we have Michael Frank, President and CEO. CEO of Revive and Derek Welsh, its COO. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome as well. Thank you for having us. All right. Well, the, the time is yours whenever you're ready. Appreciate it. Uh, look forward to going through the uh, overview of the company and uh, we'll just get the slides loaded up. Could you load up the slides here? Okay. So just a bit of background, I once again appreciate uh, the opportunity to, uh, to present Revive for those who might not be familiar with it, but Revive predominantly is a company that's focused on uh, life sciences and a repurposing a uh, number of different drugs. Um, our lead uh, platform right now is a drug called uh, Bacillamine, and our strategy really is evolving around uh, Bacillamine psilocybin and uh, we have a lot of history working on the pharma side with uh, with cannabis as well um, our focus has been targeting rare disorders infectious diseases and um, company started back it's around 2013 14 time frame was working with different repurposed drugs and uh, the obviously one of the goals was to uh, leverage uh, some of the fda incentives and programs like uh, orphan drug designation uh, fast track status, a breakthrough therapy. So uh, Revive goes back to sort of around the 20, sort of 14 timeframe, uh, 13, 14, and um, a big focus was on repurposing drugs and looking for optimum drugs to treat uh, rare disorders. Um, if you look basically right now at our uh, patent portfolio, um, right now the, the lead drug, as I mentioned, is a drug called Bacillamine. Bacillamine is a anti-rheumatic, anti-inflammatory drug that's been used in uh, South Korea, Japan for 30 years. Uh, and uh, Revive has uh, worked with it, repurposed it back in 2015 uh, for a, a study with gout. The company ran a phase 2A study with gout uh, with successful results. And um, subsequent to that, uh, when I took over the company, I uh, looked at some of the patents portfolio and I repurposed it uh, for uh, infectious diseases, namely COVID, and the FDA uh, uh, proceeded uh, moving forward with uh, granting us the opportunity to, to launch a phase three study. So currently we're in a phase three study for bacillamine, uh, really against COVID, uh, and I can get to some more detail further on, but the, the premise there obviously is uh, because of the history with the drug uh, with gout, uh, we had um, successful results and then it sort of went, was put back in the war chest. Uh, we brought this uh, drug back right now to, to be a, um, a lead therapeutic platform uh, to treat COVID and namely other infectious diseases. Um, we also have a very strong uh, drug delivery technology uh, that's used predominantly in our psilocybin and our uh, cannabis oil uh, platforms. Uh, we work extensively with the University of Wisconsin uh, around uh, around that IP, and uh, right now we're um, working with that delivery mechanism to to do clinical work and uh, drug formulation, really around psychedelics. We have a number of different uh, platforms and products which we're working with to uh, bring a psilocybin into oral dose plat dosage platforms with um, with the delivery system from. University of Wisconsin and the uh, intellectual property that uh, that Revive has currently uh, around um, around psychedelics. Uh, we also are doing quite a bit of work um, looking at uh, basically other ver ways to create uh, psilocybin. Uh, there's psilocybin, obviously, is uh, around the psychedelic area, but there's a lot of interest right now in this sector and we're working with the University of North Carolina on a variety of different um, biosynthesis platforms to, to create uh, psilocybin from other organisms, um, which could be E. coli or yeast or areas like that. So Revive is a, 
IP company is very rich in uh, intellectual property uh, patents, and um, our goal is obviously to move it down the clinical path. We also, I should mention, uh, have done quite a bit of work with uh, CBD and uh, the, with the delivery mechanism we have from the University of Wisconsin. Um, the company has orphan drug designation from the FDA uh, to treat um, autoimmune hepatitis with CBD and also for reperfusion injury for his uh, around organ failure. So um, a lot of that platform is, is multi-purpose and we're using it as well for the psychedelic area. Just to continue on uh, in terms of what uh, we previously mentioned on the pipeline, uh, right now bacillamine uh, is, is our lead indication. Uh, it's right now currently in a phase three study. Um, psilocybin, uh, we're also marking, embarking on a, um, we started early stages there with the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy for uh, meth addiction using psilocybin and um, through some other acquisition we did with a company called Pharmathere, we acquired a lot of intellectual property uh, around psilocybin uh, to look at uh, um, traumatic brain injury and stroke. So we've done quite a bit of preclinical work with uh, National Institute of Health in, uh, in Taiwan, and we're uh, taking a lot of the intellectual property and moving that down uh, the clinical path in, uh, in North America with a number of different partners. Um, also on the psilocybin side, as I mentioned, the University of Wisconsin, we've worked uh, on the delivery systems there with them to create oral, dose plat oral dosage platforms. And um, we're going to be uh, working in that area quite extensively with a number of partners to create uh, finished product and then to take that to the FDA for, uh, for clinical, uh, clinical approval. And as I mentioned, we also have a um, Orphan drug designation around CBD for cannabis. We've got a, um, uh, a study going on also with the University of uh, Indiana right now around CBD, around autoimmune hepatitis to, uh, to move that down the clinical path as well. So our goal is really to um, you know, harness strong IP, work with leading edge partners like the universities, and uh, obviously then to take take a lot of that data, take a lot of the strength from those partnerships and move that down the clinical path uh, with the FDA. Um, as far as the lead platform, bacillamine, as I mentioned, uh, is, is a big, uh, sort of the big caveat right now. Um, we're right now in the phase three study. Well, we're on to sort of the second tier of it. Uh, we have, it's basically a double blinded randomized study, phase three for bacillamine to treat COVID. Uh, we've done the first uh, 210 patients. We're on to the sort of the second level, which is uh, it goes from 210 to 400, 600, 800, 1,000. So it's quite a big study, and um, you know we're on to the next level, and uh, we've announced uh, expansion of uh, of clinics where we're going to be holding the study. We're looking to bring on uh, up to about 50 uh, clinics right now sites in terms of rolling out. Um, phase three study around bacillamine. There's this, obviously, a, we still believe a very strong need for therapeutics. And, uh, you know, we're one of the few companies that are in the mall to moderate that uh, have a sort of a pill form that can address this, uh, this disease. So um, we, we see that uh, right now the safety has been very strong. We're continuing on. This is a double blinded study, as I mentioned. So uh, efficacy really comes at endpoints uh, more towards the end of the study. However, uh, as I mentioned in previous uh, news releases, you may have seen uh, the company is, um, you know, looking through data and discussions with, uh, you know, FDA when potentially there may be optimum times to look for uh, emergency use authorization for this drug. Uh, Revive, as I said, has a very strong history with bacillamine. Uh, bacillamine uh, ran a study in gout back in 2015. Uh, we had very favorable results. Uh, at that time, uh, we had a benchmark going up against a drug called Colchicine, and Colchicine uh, uh, was recently also in a phase three study for COVID, which was backed by Bill Gates and uh, Montreal Neurological Institute and some other players. And um, uh, I think some, you know there the reduced hospitalization. There was maybe potentially some issues around efficacy, uh, around safety, but uh, it has a strong history. Of Colchicine, and um, you know it is potential treatment as well. And our our D 
data goes back to a study that we did against colchicine back in 2015 with um, pretty strong efficacy against it. So, um, you know, we're, was I believe to, to be a, a strong contender to have a mild to moderate treatment uh, as we move, you know, towards the different benchmarks of our study. Um, the rationale really behind bacillamine, as I mentioned to you, 30 year history in uh, Japan, South Korea to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and um, it's an anti-inflammatory, uh, anti-rheumatic, antioxidant. It's a glutathione enhancer. So basically the method, method of action of the drug is that it increases the uh, glutathione in the body, which is a major antioxidant. It's a two-thiol donor and that's what differentiates this drug. It's the way it metabolizes in the liver and it's uh, the way it um, releases glutathione. So uh, the data that we had from our work with gout and also from the history of this drug, uh, having a 30 year safety uh, in, uh, in Japan and South Korea, uh, when the FDA looked at the, the platform here, they obviously um, saw that we had uh, a previous IND, we had a lot of data, we ran a study in gout. So we were fast tracked to a phase three study. The company did not do phase one or two around uh, COVID in the US. It was fast tracked to phase three where we are now. Um, so that in, in essence for a small company like ours is uh, I believe a tremendous milestone. So uh, I like obviously thank the team, uh, you know, or our group of people to move it, uh, to move it forward. Just uh, move through the slides here. Um, before we get into psychedelics, I just want to mention one other thing around, um, around bacillamine. There was also some, you know, a lot of uh, research around different drugs. There was a report uh, uh, written by University of uh, San Francisco, uh, Dr. John Fahey is part of a team there that looked at uh, thiol donors as a very effective treatment against COVID and uh, bacillamine was one of the drugs mentioned, uh, basically being such a strong thiol donor. The other drugs were cancer drugs, which were more intravenous. So there has been quite a bit of um, you know, work around some of the other drugs that are uh, intravenous delivery. Uh, there are some other anti-arthritic uh, drugs and rheumatic drugs that are being used right now uh, as well uh, from some of the majors. A lot of them are uh, intravenous um, platforms. So this, the key here is that this is a pill and the mild to moderate is, is a sector that needs to be addressed. And um, the data uh, that we have, even from the, even the North American report that came on, uh, came about from the University of California, San Francisco, which talked about Thiel donors being very effective treatments uh, for COVID uh, that that had a major uh, you know major positive impact on on our plans. So um, you know we're we're taking all this data moving forward, and you know so far the study is going you know fairly well on the safety side, um, and um, you know, everybody have to start to stay tuned in terms of how that all develops. On the psychedelic platform, uh, uh, Derek Welsh, who's our CEO of the uh, of Silicon Pharma company we acquired, um, could get into it a little more, but a uh, little bit of background here is uh, back in uh, sort of early spring of 2020, acquired Silicon Pharma. They had quite a bit of intellectual property uh, around uh, formulation development for psilocybin and Revive acquired that uh, company. Uh, to use as a platform and to to work with then the University of Wisconsin on delivery to take this to the next level clinically into the market. So that we acquired that company back in sort of April 2020, and we started to work on psilocybin oral thin formulations, and um, that is sort of one of the lead projects around psilocybin. And as I mentioned, we're working on very unique um, as well as psilocybin biosynthetic and enz mild platforms, basically to create psilocybin from other organisms uh, as well. So, um, you know, we're, there's been a lot of press in this area on psychedelics, you know, Revive has been talked about as well. You know, we're probably one of the top four or five companies at, in this space doing a lot of work. So um, this is another strong platform for the company. Uh, Derek, you wanna add uh, some stuff to that? 
Yeah, Revive has really taken a, a multi-pronged approach to uh, looking at psilocybin and what we're developing. Uh, when we look at psilocybin, our, our biosynthesis platform is really unique in the sense that when we build this car, if you think of the platform itself as a vehicle, when you build the car, you're building a really great chassis, and then the vehicle that you put on top of it is really your decision at the end. Right now, we've started building the platform to work on psilocybin and synthesis of psilocybin. So when we start that platform at the end of the day, we're able to change out a couple of parts. And hopefully, once the research progresses, we're able to develop other psychedelic compounds from this biosynthesis platform. So it's really, really unique. Uh, we look at the work and the accomplishments that we've had through the University of Wisconsin. The development of our oral thin film prototype was a huge milestone for us. And when we look at the benchtop testing that we've done with it, we showed great dissolution rates, we showed the ability for absorption, and we showed you know tremendous opportunity with this particular platform. Um, most recently, we've announced uh, some progress through Pharmathere um, and the assets that we acquired through them. We showed uh, in a mouse model, now all drugs that you see on the market today at one point in time started as a mouse model. Um, when we look at the mouse model that we gained from this, uh, we saw significant um, movement in how we address brain injury, stroke, and TBI. Um, these are really hot topics right now. You know, uh, when we look at um, head injury and we look at stroke and we look at um, brain injury itself, um, it's a field that can be uniquely addressed. And we showed some really positive signs in our research with regards to the use of psilocybin in the treatment of acute brain injury. And this is something that was... Uh, was, it was quite unique. We know psilocybin shows very uh, shows a lot of promise with regards to depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And we thought, looking at it, well, let's take a good look at um, how it may address brain injury as well, because of its, uh, you know, the research we've seen now is it shows a reprogramming of the brain. It shows the ability to teach other parts of the brain to talk back and forth to each other, which otherwise might be damaged as a direct result of stroke or TBI. So it's um it's a really promising um, uh, field to be in at this stage. Thanks, Derek. So yes, yeah, so as Derek mentioned, so you know we're we're looking to become a, a leader and uh, around around formulation development for psychedelics, predominantly in the psilocybin platform. So we're building rich IP, as I said, around delivery, around uh, biosynthesis, and um, around down the road to, to move that through the clinical path is we've got quite a bit of experience, you know, working with the FDA on a number of other studies. So um, psychedelics are in an area that uh, you're going to hear a lot more about uh, right now. I mean, Canada, a lot of the companies are out of Canada working on it, but I mean, the U S uh, you know, does pave the way uh, clinically. So we're very excited about, uh, you know, having an opportunity to work with some, uh, some key leading U S uh, universities and institutions. A little bit more about um, what I talked about before is uh, the way uh, our differentiator really in delivery is around um, around the cannabis and on the psilocybin psychedelic side is um, TAN and Shitizen, which is a unique delivery system that we have um, from the University of Wisconsin, which have licensed to tannins uh, and Shitizens, which are basically um, you know shrimp and other plant-based formulations they showed a lot of promise in working uh, when when a lot of work was done with CBD to address things like wound healing and so forth. But with the psychedelic side, with psilocybin, we believe that uh, tannin is in and the delivery mechanism uh, from our studies and you know work that we've done at the university preclinically and clinically that um, certain features like faster onset, uh, more enhanced delivery, there's advantages to use this tannin shitazin platform. So we're going to continue to use it for uh, psilocybin and for cannabis oil. Um, just to mention a couple other things as well on the uh, the work around the uh, cannabis oil sector. Revive has uh, uh, orphan drug designation for CBD to treat uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, that was back uh, work that initially started at the University of South uh, Carolina, and now we're uh, working with the University of Indiana to move that uh, forward. And we've also got, as I mentioned, orphan drug designation around rep perfusion injury with um, with CBD. So uh, those are two, two key designations that we look to move forward. We are uh, embarking on right now as well as study with uh, Indiana right around autoimmune hepatitis and CBD. So we've got a number of different studies going on right to support our clinical uh, path.
strategic partners uh, right now, Farm Alum, which is a CRO that uh, we work with. Uh, we have North, um, North Carolina State University We're working predominantly on the biosynthesis, the delivery systems with Wisconsin uh, and University of South Carolina, where we've done uh, early work with uh, cannabis oil to treat autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, we're strong partners of the University of um, well, Wisconsin Wharf, which is a, basically a, a division of it where uh, we've got strong licenses on delivery. And um, we also have a pretty strong relationship with a company called Pharmathair, which is a, a leader in uh, ketamine, clinical work around ketamine. And uh, we acquired a lot of the psilocybin assets from them around stroke TBI. Just to quickly, uh, address the you know, Q1, Q2, a uh, little history on Revive. I mean, I took over Revive back in, uh, in uh, sort of early 2020, had a market cap at the time around 1.52 million Canadian. Right now it's got about 150 million Canadian. Um, we have acquired a um, you know, strong psychedelic platform, moved the cannabinoid uh, forward. Uh, Basilamine is, is, the, is the lead platform, lead uh, initiative right now. And we're at right in the midst of it in the study. As I mentioned to you, um, we've got oral film, thin film development going on, and we made a lot of work there. There'll be more news coming out on that as well shortly in the interim. And we have, uh, as I mentioned, with the University of um, uh, Wisconsin, we're into a meth addiction study with psilocybin phase one. So moving all those forward into Q2, uh, that, that's our plan to really to, uh, to move the study forward, get to the next level on the, on the bacillomy trial, and uh, move some of the initiatives forward around psilocybin and cannabinoid. Uh, looking at sort of the market and uh, I guess comparisons um, from an investor perspective. So um, obviously you have the top tier vaccine companies uh, and um, you know a lot of therapeutics, Gilead, Regeneron, companies like that. Uh, right now at, uh, at the level uh, of some of the other therapeutics, I guess the next tier, you have companies like Citadin, Relief, Vaxart, Revive. Um, that's how we sort of compare around the sort of infectious disease uh, uh, COVID story. But there's really, I don't know many phase three companies right now in the market treating COVID that have a valuation of 151 million Canadian. Uh, that is a lot of growth over the year for Revive. But, um, you know, obviously I think there's a lot of uh, upside as we move through the study and uh, the comparatives on some of the other players show that, uh, you know, Revive still has a very, uh, very attractive valuation. If you look at the psychedelic market, which is the other end of our business, where I mentioned we're probably considered top five in in, uh, in that area, um, the leader in psychedelics is Compass. Compass is uh, trades on Nasdaq and it's got a 1.6 billion valuation. These are some of the other players, and um, you know how we stack up against it. So, a lot in the psychedelic area, everybody is working extensively on on different projects. Uh, there's companies like Mind Medicine. Uh, Psybin, Compass. So um, our focus really, as I mentioned, is predominantly on psilocybin. And um, that's that's where a lot of our clinical work will be around. The team, as I mentioned, is myself and the chairman and CEO, Derek uh, Carmel Morelli, who's our CFO. Um, got a, a strong clinical uh, bench, Dr. Kelly McKee, who's um, uh, ex-military, is, is our key um, chief scientific officer. Um, we have basically Owen Majuma, which is basically works on a lot of regulatory affairs. He's, uh, he has a past experience working uh, with Bill Gates' organization. Dr. Joel Moody, who's an epidemiologist in Canada. And uh, as mentioned, we're working uh, with Dr. John Fahey, who's a pulmonary specialist, University of uh, San Francisco. He's a scientific and clinical consultant. And he was one of the authors on a recent paper that uh, field donors could be a uh, you know major uh, treatment around around COVID, so um, you know he's quite interested in in our work, and uh, you know we're going to be doing uh, uh, a lot more work uh, with that uh, with that entity and organization, that university, uh, go forward. Uh, and the board of directors is myself and uh, Bill Jackson. Bill Jackson is uh, CEO of a company called Atwill, which is a, a drug company in the U.S. and um, and some other key. Uh, individuals from the uh, cannabis and financial um, areas. So basically, this stock information, uh, RVV is a symbol, 
uh, our ETF in the US and um, just a little bit of, of what we uh, look like in terms of market cap, as I mentioned, right now we trade for about 150 million Canadian market cap. Uh, the company uh, was pretty well self-funded up till about uh, February timeframe when I raised uh, about 23 million Canadian to move studies forward clinically. But um, you know we're uh, we're looking to obviously continue our work around psilocybin and cannabis and um, psilocybin as the lead platform, lead story. You know, getting getting to the end of the trial and the endpoints. Appreciate all your time, and I guess we could open up to some questions right now. All right, great presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, we do have a few questions. Sure, thank you. So, do you have any information to share on the expanded access protocol for severe COVID patients and how closely to 400 uh, patients for the phase three are you? Okay, um, I know there's been obviously a lot of talk and I, I read it on, on some of the social media. So I just, I just want to sort of be clear. So fa phase three studies are, you know, are, are not easy to get. I mean, it, it was a tremendous milestone for the company. Uh, and, um, you know, and right now we are, you know, moving into the second tier, which is, you know, towards the 400 level, which we hope to have uh, completed uh, over the next uh, month or so. And um, that is based on our protocol from mild to moderate. So uh, that is what uh, we are in a phase three style for mild to moderate patients. Uh, we also uh, have, have expanded access protocol to, we applied we, uh, to the FDA a while ago for more severe um, we're not working at this point, at this time, on, on a severe population. Of course, there's an opportunity to, to prescribe the uh in a situation where a doctor would uh, or a patient would agree to do a sort of a patient IND, and we could apply to the FDA for that. But um, there have been inquiries. But right now, we're focused much more on mild to moderate, and uh, th that's that's the, the study is around around mild to moderate and. Um, We'll see what happens down the road on, on more severe patients. Bacillamine is a very versatile drug, and um, you know there there is opportunity, obviously, to potentially use it in in more of a hospital setting. Right now, it's mild to moderate. People are going to uh, the physician or predominantly the, the sites that we have, and they're you know they're getting, they're coming onto the program. So our goal is to to ramp quickly and to you know try to get to um, to the different endpoints and at what point the FDA uh, will will look at the data and consider emergency use authorization. I mean, I, I really don't have an answer or can answer that, but um, you know, with COVID, uh, the way it, you know, it's st still in the market in terms of you know, affecting a lot of people and uh, treatments are needed. So um, potentially there could be more flexibility down the road. We're just heads down on the study and uh, so far, you know, the safety has, has been very good and we're continuing on. And I mentioned bacillamine has a long history of safety, 30 years. And uh, the key here is it's a pill, mild to moderate. So um, there's not a lot of, you know, there, there have been some other, you know, companies around talking about pill uh, therapeutics and there is a need for that. So not only for, um, for North America, but all over the world. Because you know, obviously, the logistics around delivery are more advantageous. I probably been, answered. A few, I probably answered a few. <laughs> uh, a few. I gave you a few answers in one question. You so. did, but that's good. We have quite a few questions, so sure. we probably won't get to all of them. But we will absolutely send these to you so you can respond on your own. But have you been approached by any of the major biotech companies regarding your patents? Uh, can't really. You know, comment on that right now. Um, I, you know, obviously, this is a great platform to get better known in the U.S. And, uh, and you know, we want to, you know, we're happy to participate. But, um, you know, as I get as we move more towards this, you know, different endpoints of the study, I guess it uh, there'll be the opportunity to uh, to to bring more strategic players to the table. Um, there's a lot of interest in the work we're doing clinically from universities and so forth. So. Um, I guess everybody will have to stay tuned. 
And then if the EAU application is submitted, what are your thoughts for commercialization, partnerships? Talk about the future with that. I mean, obviously, the you know, once again, um, phase three is a major milestone specifically on uh, a disease like COVID where you know, we haven't seen anything like this in 100 years. So, um, it, you know, we're, we want to, it's all about, you know, data and, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we can't move things along faster than, than process. So, um, you know, the FDA, the, the Data Management Review Board looks at the data and, uh, you know, our goal right now is to continue to the next level. So, you know, we're in communication with the FDA and when that might happen, I, I don't have an answer. We have announced that, you know, we are we are going to them. We are in discussion. So it could be sooner than later, but I, I don't know. But right now uh, with COVID, obviously there are, um, you know, rules are being sort of uh, bent, I guess, in some respects. But, uh, you know, the key here is this drug has a lot of safety, has a strong history. And, uh, you know, we believe based on our other study on gout and based on its history for 30 years um, treating arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, that it will be effective. You know, it's a double blinded study. So, you know, you have to, doctors, patients really don't know if they're getting the placebo or they're getting, getting the drug. But as we move to the next level, we'll be, you know, we're going to be doing, um, you know, more, the dosage will be either in increased or decreased depending on the SMB's analysis. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue communicating with the regulatory bodies. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk on the company, on the drug, on Dr. Yo, Dr. Drew. I mean, we just want to get the company, you know, obviously better known to, to the right people and to show that, uh, that this drug could have an impact uh, to treat mild to moderate. And, and the data supports that. And some of the work done by the University of California in San Francisco supports that that, um, you know, that sealed donors uh, are, are uh, effective way. I should mention also, um, before, I mean, Israel rolled out a lot of uh, their vaccines, they were using a uh, over-the-counter drug called nasocysteine. And a lot of the data from preclinical work, bacillamine showed that uh, bacillamine is, was, is 16 times more powerful than nasocysteine which is a, it was a big uh, premise uh, in terms of the FDA, um, you know, fast tracking this to the phase three, as well as our work in gout, as well as the safety uh, and efficacy for 30 years in South Korea and Japan. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, we'll, we're working, uh, we want to try to move things as quickly as we can uh, by abiding, also by, by abiding by uh, the regulatory agencies. Is there any potential for bucillamine being a nebulized treatment? Yeah, I mean, there definitely is. Um, you know, we have to, you know, right now it's all about data. And, um, you know, we, we, we just want to continue moving, moving down the path. Um, you know, there's different ways to deliver this drug. I mean, it's a very versatile drug. It, it could work, we believe, not only. Uh, the premise here is like that bacillamine, because of its method of action, it's a two-thiol donor, the way it metabolizes in the liver, anti-rheumatic, anti-inflammatory. Um, and when you get, um, you know, obviously COVID creates a, a cytokine storm and uh, bacillamine is effective at um, you know, suppressing a lot of these cytokines that get out of hand. So, um, you know, we... You know, we're just continuing on the study and, you know, try to reach the endpoints. But the past history is very strong to support the hypothesis here that bacillamine will be an effective treatment uh, to treat COVID. It's also, I mean, I can't get into like price points and mechanism, but I mean, it, it is a, it's not a very expensive drug uh, and uh, it could be easily deployed. So it has a lot of the, you know, the areas that need to be addressed, which is a pill, mild to moderate, uh, you know, easily delivered, doesn't need, uh, you know, a lot of logistics around it. And um, it's versatile. I mean, it could be used in a lot of other areas. Uh, the Solmine has worked, and there's a lot of preclinical work to show that it's reduced uh, inflammation uh, around heart, heart surgery prior or after um, other organs of the body, kidney. So, 
it has has a lot of uh, work to support its um, suppression of inflammation around uh, around other organs, and a lot of that work was done uh, uh, preclinically in the U.S. a number of years ago. So. Well, we have a few questions about how many numbers have you treated. So how many patients have been treated with bucilamine and how closely to 400 patients for the phase three are you? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, the study is a thousand people. So, you know, the, the timelines on that, like we hope to have that, you know, towards the end of Q2 into Q3, um, you know, it's, it, those are sort of timelines right now. Um, you know, we're, I can't give you the exact numbers, but we're, you know, over the first thresholds and we're into, into hitting sort of the second milestones, which we should have, you know, over the next, you know, into sort of May, June timeframe. So uh, we're bringing on sites, um, you know, there's a lot of logistics around this. We're not, uh, you know, we're not the biggest company in the world. So um, we have to maximize our resources and, uh, you know, we're, we're pulling in, uh, starting to pull in a number of clinics. I know a number have been posted uh, in the, uh, on clinical trials. And right I think we have around 17. So we're going to be going up to probably around 50 and, um, you know, and then we're going to hit these endpoints, let's say the next several endpoints and, uh, see what the FDA, you know, has to say about, uh, about EUA. You know, we're talking to the FDA right now, so I don't have any uh, specific feedback yet, but, um, once you hit these endpoints, they have to also look at, um, you know, it takes a bit of time to look at the data, right? But so far, you know, our safety has been uh, been uh, been strong, and that's a lot to do with obviously the history of, of the drug, and um, one of the, one of the key factors here. Okay, well, you can you uh, hash that out a little bit more? There are some questions regarding um, your announcement and the conversations with the FDA regarding submitting an EUA for bucilamine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, right as I said to you, the the the, the data, data management review board looks at the data and then they submit it to the EUA. So, you know that that is in the work still uh, around around the levels we're at. So I don't have an answer on on when or that may happen. Um, they may look at it now. They may decide that there's a potential to do it uh, at the next level. So it's it, those are calls that that really are driven by the, uh, uh, you know, data, data science management review board and the, uh, and basically then the FDA. So um, uh, most, most of the companies that, um, you know, except for some of the big pharma, they were given you know, EUA earlier on. I mean, usually are going to, you know, a little more down the line in terms of endpoints. So, um, the bottom line is we're we're trying to do something at this time. Uh, I don't have an answer if uh, when it may happen, but it, it's obviously of interest for us to to get that done as soon as we can, for, uh, you know, in, in in parallel to completing the study. So it could happen soon. It could happen at 400. It could happen at 600. It's 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 hard for me to say. So do you believe the introduction of psychedelics to the clinical world may help bring about changes to modern clinical trials as we know it? I sure hope so. And then talk a little bit about some of your biggest hurdles over the next six to 12 months and how you plan to get over them. Um, maybe I'll, I'll let Derek answer the psychedelics angle and then I'll, I'll come back in on, on this, some of the other questions. So psychedelics is a, is a unique opportunity. Uh, right now, the regulatory pathway that we have is only clinical. That's all that's really available to us right now. Um, the big amount of uh, the body of work that's being done in the psychedelic space is primarily going to be research until whether a state or whether a nation or a group or a country authorize the use of psychedelics for treatments. Now, granted, in Canada and in the U.S., you can do ketamine clinics are perfectly legal, but they're inherently expensive. Um, they're inherently expensive for the treatment protocols, but they're also an opportunity to start using psychedelics for the treatment of depression, addiction, things like that. And where our body of work is really focused on, we're a researching company. We pride ourselves on our relationships with our partners and our relationships with our institutions in order to further 
further our research. So when it comes to the work that we've done with Wisconsin, the work that we're doing with Carolina State, the work that we're doing with other institutions, it's really important at this stage that we're able to actually work with psilocybin, we're able to do laboratory work, we're able to do preclinical and clinical work. Um, and this is really where the industry is today. And once either legalization or a, you know, for example, psychedelic therapy clinics start opening up, we'll be there when the market is ready for it. Thanks, Derek. I mean, uh, that's good. I think, I guess, I guess in some of the, uh, I guess the comments around your other questions, um, you know, going forward, I mean, obviously, uh, the company, uh, you know, wants to move the facility trial as quickly as possible. So the rolling out of that is, uh, is key and foremost. Um, you know, I, this company, as I mentioned, had a lot of strong IP and, uh, you know, I took it over back uh, as I was an investor in the company and uh, I always had a, uh, an admiration and I believed a lot of the intellectual property. And, uh, you know, when I took it over, I mentioned to you, it was sort of like a hidden gem with a 1.5 million Canadian market cap. And, uh, you know, through the team, we were able to take it to, to this level. Uh, and we did that actually only on, uh, on $2 million. So now that, you know, we funded up around 23 million back in February, you know, we have enough cash to go to, you know, you know, subsequent levels. And uh, our, my goal is to to basically, you know, work with the best teams and groups to commercialize and harness and clinically enhance the intellectual property. Um, so, uh, you know, the compelling story here from an investor perspective is there's really no company in the world that's in a phase three that's worth less than right now, 800, a billion. So. You get the best of both worlds with Revive. You have a psychedelic company, one of the top five, and a phase three imbecilomine. It sets us apart. And, uh, you know, I'd like, obviously, investors to to recognize that. Um, you know, we, we uh, have accomplished a lot. Obviously, uh, we're continuing down the path. And, uh, you know, we'll get hopefully more recognized by regulatory groups, agencies, and um, you know, we're, we're a Canadian company, but all our work's in the U.S., so I really appreciate uh, all the U.S. shareholders and support and, um, you know, all our partners. But um, uh, that's, that's our goal, and uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep striving forward. Thank you. This was a great presentation, a great, great company. Thank you, Mike and Derek, for your thorough presentation, your knowledge in this, in this sector. So we look forward to following up with your updates in the future. Thank you so much for having us, and thanks you all, shareholders, for your support. And uh, we'll uh, we'll keep communicating with you when we can. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, guys. All right, it's been a great morning so far. We're going to move on to our next presenter. Remember that you're going to experience a black screen for a brief moment as we move on. Uh, but stay with us. We're coming right back. And if you're on your Apple device click that play button to launch the next live presentation. We'll be right with you.